Okay, we're going to discuss the laws of tshuva. The days from Rosh Hashanah through Yom Kippur refer to as seres yimei tshuva, the 10 days of repentance or penitence. It is only because uh, the Gemara cites a posuk, a verse from Yeshaya. Isaiah says, Dushu Hashem bi motzo, krobi you should seek out Hashem when he's found and you should call to him when he's close to you. This 10 day period is a time that God is closest to us than any other time of the year. You know, when we complete the Nila service, we say Hashem Kim. God is the, is the Almighty. We say it seven times. And we all say it in unison. First, the Chazan, the Shlich Tzibor, he says it seven times, Hashem Elohim. And then the congregation, the Tzibor, follows by saying it, Hashem Elohim, Hashem Elohim, seven times. We all proclaim publicly, God is the Almighty. When did this actually, when was the first time this was ever said? We read in prophets in the time of Eliyahu Novi, the king was evil and he had killed all the prophets. There were only a hundred prophets that were hid away and it was through the sacrifice of Avadja Hanovi, Obadiah, who himself was a courtier in the, in the court of Achav. He had a wife, she was evil. Her name was Izevel, Jezebel. And Elio was hunted by Achav for 22 years and he couldn't find him. Finally, after 22 years, and this during this 22 year period, there was a famine in Israel that the crops didn't grow. People were eating the horses. They were eating rodents. There was nothing to eat. And finally, Achav is walking through the desert. And who does he meet? He meets Elijah the prophet. And only because Elio allowed himself to be found. And he says to Elio the prophet, Elio Novi, he refers to him, he says, you've besmirched and you've putrefied the Jewish people. You have this, the man who was an idolater, the man who killed the majority of the prophets, the man who blasphemes God, he refers to the prophet of Hashem, Elia Novi, who ultimately is going to be the one to introduce the coming of Mashiach. He refers to him, you putrefied the Jewish people. You're a disgrace to us. So Elio says to him, you know, Achov, stop deluding yourself. We're going to have a showdown at high noon on the top of Mount Carmel because Achov, he actually believed that the idolatry, the deity he believed in was called Baal, the deity of the Baal. And the prophets of the Baal were his prophets. He says, we're going to high noon, we're going to go to the top of Mount Carmel we're going to have the whole Jew, all the Jews there. The whole Jewish people are going to be there. And your prophets will build their altar. They'll bring the sacrifice to their deity, what they believe in. And Lahavdil, I'll bring an, uh, build an altar for Hashem. And I will also bring the sacrifice. And we'll see what is truth and what is falsehood. So the whole Jewish people gather on top of Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, they build their altar. They slaughter the, the animal. They bring the sacrifice. And they begin dancing and chanting. You know, the way you used to see at the back of trucks in Manhattan, Dari Krishnas and their robes jumping and dancing and screaming. That, that, was, that, that was the ritual of idolatry. So Elijah the prophet says to them, 
and nothing was happening. He says, maybe your God is a little hard of hearing. Maybe you got to scream a little louder. And maybe if you screamed louder, he would listen. Nothing happens. Elio builds his altar. He has a pail of water. He has the animal there. He sacrifices it, sacrifices it, puts it on the altar. And he says three words. Aneni Hashem Aneni. Answer me, God, answer me. The moment he said that, a ball of fire comes out of heaven, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the stones, consumes the pale Lord, everything disappears. Meaning God embraced Elio's service. The Jews, this was witnessed by every Jew of the Jewish people at the time. All the Jews, when they saw this, they prostrated themselves, full prostration, and they all said, Hashem Hu Elohim, God is the Almighty. This confirms God is the Almighty, and this was an open refutation for idolatry, that the idolatry has no value whatsoever. We, at the end of Yom Kippur, for 10 days, the Navi tells us, the prophet tells us, Isaiah, Dishu Hashem Bimotso, seek out God when he's found, Krobi Yosekorov, call him when he's close. But after the Elah, the Shechina, the divine presence, ascends, and the seven heavens. Every time we say Hashem Elohim once, it ascends another level. And finally, by the time we say the last Hashem Elohim, that means the Shechina ascended totally. And it's back at the location that normally is in terms of its proximity or its availability to us. Right now, God's presence is found, it's close to us, it's available to us. And therefore, Yeshaya encourages us. And as the Talmud tells us, one doesn't have to have, to have the merit of a tzibur, of a quorum, for God to answer, answer us because he's so intimate with us during this time, every one of us has that accessibility to be able to call him and he will respond to every one of us. So what we're able to accomplish during this 10 day period, sensitivity wise, effort wise to bring about the end result, it's a lot easier to accomplish it now than during the year. And that's why the Navi, he encourages us. These are the 10 days of penitence. Asura Yomim, the words of the Gemara, 10 days between Rosh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, between Rosh Hashanah and the day in Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. This is what it's about. Now, let's try to understand what is tshuva, what is repentance. We find that the Navi refers to Tshuva as chesed. It's God's kindness that he forgives us. So the question is, if two individuals, they have some kind of disagreement, or even worse than that, one person betrays the other, and the other, the one who's betrayed, forgives the one who betrayed him, because the one who betrayed him really is sincerely ask for forgiveness, and forgiveness, forgives him. It's say the right things to forgive. If he's two-faced, he doesn't, he's not, doesn't mean what he's saying. So of course, he doesn't deserve to be forgiven. But if a person's sincere and he says, I really, I regret it, I feel terrible, I wish I never did it, and I will never repeat it again. That that he forgives it, is that a chesed? It's a special kindness. It's, it's the right thing, the man, sincerely admits his mistake, his fault, his wrongness, you forgive him. But yet God's forgiving us is at another level of forgiveness. It's chesed. It's an exceptional kindness. So maybe the way we'll differentiate between communists who sin against one another, who betray, even betrayal, is because you're commoners. But what does it mean if you go and you betray the king? That touches upon insubordination. That's rebellion, especially if you do it deliberately, you do it defiantly, 
or even inadvertently. How do you cross that line even inadvertently? You should have been more careful. You should have taken every precaution. You should have asked a thousand people. Could you imagine? You have the throne of the king and a person needs a place to sit down. And he knows one of the locate places in this room is the location where the king sits. And he, instead of asking anyone, is this seat vacant? Whose seat is it? He figures he'll sit wherever he chooses to sit. And he happens to choose to sit in the king, in the, in, on the throne of the king. The king walks in and who does he see sitting on his throne? No. Tom, Dick, or Harry, whoever you want to call them. What does the king think? He's enraged. There's an open level of insubordination. And the person is in a deep sleep with a cigar between two of his fingers, with his legs up on, on the table in front of the throne. And he wakes him up. He says, excuse me, what are you doing here? He says, I need a place to sit down. He says, do you realize where you're sitting? He says, no, he's sitting on the throne of the king. He says, well, I didn't realize it. He says, how do you not realize it? If you knew the throne of the king is in this room, before you sat on that throne, you should have asked a thousand people to make sure you were not sitting on the throne of the king. Well, it was a mistake. It's inadvertent. I didn't do it deliberately. It's unforgivable. Understanding it's like a person walking through a minefield and he knows in this area, their minds, how do you not take every precaution not to walk through that field because the moment you step on that mine, well, it was, it was, it was accidental. Accidental doesn't mean anything. You step on the mine, your life is over. It's no different than that. Life is a minefield, a minefield. Factually speaking, every one of us has a very serious blind spot. It's due to the sin of Adam eating of the tree of knowledge. He ingested a fruit which contained unadulterated evil and it was embedded in the emotion, in the physicality of the human being. And we have a strong addiction to be inclined to go after that. And we yearn for it. And we want it. And you have to put on the brakes really seriously. And it presents itself like it's the best thing in the world. It deludes us, deceives us, fools us, hoodwinks us, whatever word you want to use, continuously. And we failed and we knew we failed. And for a moment we said, you know, if I would have known, I wouldn't. But yet, one does take a precaution not to cross the line again. And this is human behavior, day in, day out. I knew I shouldn't have, but. And again, you do it. And again, you do it. And the more you do it, the more difficult it is to extricate yourself from that level of behavior. Because anything which is habitual is almost impossible to break. You know, people have issues. They have to take medication. Without the intervention of medication, they can't control their lives. If a person becomes a repeated offender, and habitually, he does and he crosses lines and transgresses continuously. Literally, it's almost impossible. He doesn't even need the evil inclination whispering into his ear. He naturally gravitates there to again cross the lines. The Talmud tells us that when a person becomes a repeated offender, the words are, it becomes permitted. So how does it become permitted? It's forbidden. It's the equivalent of becoming permitted. Because once a person crosses a line more than once, twice, then in his mind, his perception is it's not wrong. It's permitted. What is the understanding? A person wants to do the right thing. You know, one of the innate characteristics which every Jew possesses is the characteristic of Baishonim. A Jew has a natural inborn sensitivity not to do anything which is unconscionable, which is shameful. 
And that is one of the, that's one of the safeguards that Jew has in, in built in to our system that to cross a line where you're going to have shame, you'll be shamed because of your behavior, ashamed because of the behavior, which touches upon your conscience. There's no conscience like the Jewish conscience. This conscience is part of our gene genealogy, and we inherit this from Avraham Avinu. There's no conscience like the Jewish conscience, okay? So therefore, we talk about guilt. The Jew even assumes guilt for something that he's not even guilty for. If there's a problem in the world, although it's not our problem, Jews, for some reason, feel it's their problem, and they have to address the problem. It's not theirs. And the world itself says, you know, you Jews, you have to, you're at fault. I mean, there's a world, eight and a billion people, 16 million Jews, less than a speck on the spectrum. And yet the world says to the Jew, it's, you should have assumed responsibility for that. To be eight and a billion people. We're not even noticeable, period. We should assume responsibility. Well, you realize the Jew has a conscience and is always assuming responsibility beyond all the eight and a half billion peoples combined. The Jewish conscience says, that's the case, you should be responsible. You know, we're brain dead. You guys are not brain dead. Therefore, you people should, you know? The world holds the Jew to a higher standard. They could slaughter thousands of Palestinians themselves. No problem. One border policeman kills a terrorist where he could have shot him in the leg rather than killing him. The whole world is in arms. They're taking Israel to the world court in The Hague, or the UN is censoring them. What's going on over here? We're talking about intelligent people, fair. Where, where are they? That's just the reality of, of existence. That's it. So if, why, if you repeat something more than once, it becomes permitted? Because of, this is the understanding. A person crosses a line once, mistakenly, even deliberately. We're only human. So he'd say, my desire got the best of me. But I failed. But after realizing that your desire got the best of you, what should you do? If you understand it's wrong, you take every precaution that your desire should not get the best of you. And we once mentioned, the name of the morale of Prague, it says in Pirkei Ovos, if you consider these three things, you'll never, you will never be in the clutches of sin. The Mishnah says clutches of sin. So the morale of Prague asks, it says you will not come to sin. What are the clutches of sin? What are the three? Know from where you come, where are you going, and before who you will stand, to give a reckoning. Before, from where do you come? From the future droplet of semen. Where are you going? To the location of worms and maggots. And before who you will stand, before the king of kings, you're gonna have to give a reckoning. And if you consider those three, th those three things, you'll never come to the clutches of sin. Moral explains of Prague, once you're in the clutches of sin, a person goes on, out on a limb, which he shouldn't have gone on that limb. And he's at the end of that limb. It's not so simple to inch yourself back to the trunk of the tree to be in a secure place. Because you're ready, you're at the, at the edge. Once you're ready in the clutches of sin, to extricate yourself is nearly impossible. So how does one create a mindset, not allow himself to even get near there, that you always have an arm's length distance that you can still take control of your life. Consider these three things. Of course, we're always susceptible to sin, but you won't be in the clutches of sin. Of course, once you go into the clutches of sin, then it's what? You're ready on a downward swing and you're going against the laws of gravity. To go against that, the forces of gravity, you can't, it's too difficult. You're cascading down a mountain. How do you put on the brakes? Nearly most times you can't, and it's over. So a person himself sins once, you to realize how vulnerable you are. But now that you realize, what should you do now? Take every precaution, not even to come within the context of the clutches of sin. So why don't you take the precaution? The answer is, you know, son, because you're interested in it. 
because it's something which I find is okay. I want more of it. But if you want more of it, now you have a problem because you have to live with your conscience. Because if you have a conscience and there's no conscience like the Jewish conscience, how could I do something which I know is wrong? There's only one answer. You justify it. After, if you want to go back, after realizing something's wrong, the only way you could go back there, you have to come and put it in a context that it's permitted. Because if it's not in a context permitted, you can't live with your conscience. And nobody could live with guilt. So what do you do? You just bury it. And when you bury it, it's something, it may not have a hechsher. The rabbi may have not put a stamp of approval on it, but I don't see why it's not permitted. I think it's okay. Okay? Once you see it's okay and you believe it's okay, you sleep well at night. And you're fully tranquil, satisfied, and you want more of that. And just keeps building on it. That's what happens. It's like a person is a criminal and he gets, he gets very good at what he does. And eventually he believes he'll never get caught. And then eventually he gets caught. And when he gets caught, the judge gives him a judgment that he regrets after the first time wanted to realize how wrong his behavior was. Because now it's too late. Now you're going to the, to the guillotine. Now your life's over. But all along, he believed in his own narrative. I'm so good at it. And he had every justification. These people have so much money. And if you steal from the Federal Reserve, you steal from the American government, they have so much money. Does it really make a difference? Well, they even though it's missing, but it doesn't justify stealing. But they won't catch it. I've come up with a approach. I'll call it a loophole, but it's not a loophole. Yeah, if you, you, you speak to Meyer Lansky and he's your accountant, he'll find you out kind of loophole, right? But it's not accepted by the government. And that's the eight Sahara, the evil inclination. He's the equivalent of that. He's even better than that Meyer Lansky. He could give you loopholes that it gives you enough rope to hang yourself with it. And he could give, dig you a grave so deep that you can never crawl out of that grave, even when you're alive. Because you're so convinced what I'm doing is not so terrible. And if it is, it's too late to come back. I'm beyond, I'm beyond correction. If it would have been early, maybe. Now it's, I'm too far gone. See, so he has you coming and going. When a person is in that state, firstly, how does he do tshuva? Could it, an addict, a person's an addict, could he, could he, unless there's some kind of level of intervention in his life, medical intervention, or he somehow actually controlled, put into a controlled environment, there's no way he could take control of his life. God says you have free choice. You live in an uncontrolled environment, uncontrolled. It's up to you to create all the barriers and all the infrastructure of control. That's up to you. What happens person didn't? Early enough, now what do you do? If a person even wants to do tshuva, you want to, God will give special, he will intervene. You'll have that outside intervention to give you the ability to maybe understand how to take control of your life. So not only is tshuva chesed, as we're gonna explain, not only is the process of repentance, the ultimate kindness, the reason why it is, because if a person repents and it's only lip service, and it's not really sincere, it's not reality, even if it is sincere, but it's called delusion. It's like the morale of Prague speaks, explains, person speaks his mind, speaks whatever comes to mind, regardless whether it's constructive, negative constructive talk, not constructive, whether it's fully truthful, whether it's not truthful, and his mouth, He's a first-class gossiper. And the man's been doing it for, for 30 years, 40 years. Now all of a sudden he realizes, you know, it's time to make a change. This coming year, Yom Kippur, he makes a commitment. This coming year, I will not speak another word of Lashon Hara. You know, impossible. Now, how, how do you make that change? You know, 
Life doesn't change in a moment. You can begin a process, but it doesn't change in a moment. It's a process. And even the process, over time, why does it work? You're so embedded in it. How do you extricate yourself from it? The process to inch your way up, to get out of that seemingly bottomless pit, the abyss of sin, Hashem will pull you up. If you sincerely want to make a change, he will assist you to do that seemingly impossible climb, to pull out of that pit. You may fall back, but you want to go forward. And the falling back is always, the evil inclinations is again, trying to convince you it's really hopeless. You see, you tried, you failed. The person has to have a level of determination. I want to succeed. And the more you are determined to succeed, the greater will be the assistance. But if you buy into the evil inclination, what he's trying to convince you, it's hopeless. You see, it's hopeless because you see you failed. Then it's a problem. Unless you truly want to succeed despite the failing, you realize the setbacks in life. But that's all part of the chuva process. So every step of that process is chesed to get you to come to the realization. Until now, you deluded yourself, said it was okay, because you wanted to do the wrong thing. But all that we're talking about now was a person did something deliberately, whatever the level of deliberateness was, what are inadvertent? Inadvertent. I gave you an example. Sitting on the king's throne, where you should have asked a thousand people before you chose a place to sit, you felt it's not necessary. So it's due to your lack of education, lack of inquisitiveness, your lack of curiosity, your lack of sense of responsibility. That's the reason why you made, you made all these mistakes and the very serious mistakes. As I gave you an example with the minefield, it was only a mistake, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna restore your life if the per person is blown to smithereens when he steps on that mine, doesn't make a difference. The same thing. When you go and you transgress, even inadvertently, what did you do to yourself? You somehow, the person was supposed to be injected with some kind of medication and they injected with heroin. Could you imagine, God forbid? It's instead of enhancing it and conquering the bacteria or giving them that B12, which would have given all the positive energy, they injected with something which ultimately is gonna destroy him and take over his life, that he gives up, he gives up, he gives up control over his life. It's the same thing. Yeah, and you sue the hospital, therefore what? But you, you, unfortunately, you're, you're the victim. You're the victim of, and you become the addict. And that's the same thing. And that's the reality of life. You know, every night we pray in the brocha of Hashkivenu after Shema in Mairiv, Hose sod milfonein machreinu. Remove Satan from before us and behind us. As the Mesil Sushem writes in Path of the Just, it's a forefront battle. Whatever direction we're going in, you have to look over your shoulder. He's behind us, he's the side of us, in every, in, every, in every direction. And he's there to hoodwink us, undermine us. It's, and it's impossible. You know, a you know, person has battle fatigue. After a while, you know, you just can't deal with it any longer. Hashem intervenes. If you truly want, Hashem will help you. We say every morning in the Halukas, Hashem mo data novim. Person's humble. He's truly humble. But a person's humble. How much can you take? How much can you take? He's still a human being. The abuse, they ignore you. They don't value you. are human. Eventually, it gets to you. David Melch says, King David says in Psalms, Hashem Odeida Novim. He gives inner strength, conviction to the humble person. He gives him a sense of value despite whatever the world is doing externally. Hashem allows him to appreciate who he is 
and the value of that humility. But without God's intervention, giving him that sense, shoring you up, you couldn't survive it as a human being. Impossible. It's Hashem Odeira Novim. That's, that's, and that's reality of life. I always give the example. Person discovers a diamond mine. Mine. And he knows the value of what's there and what he's able to take out of there. And he has friends who, you know, they work from nine to five and they have enough time to party and do whatever else they do. And this man says, you know something? I'm not gonna be available for the next 20 years. They say, where are you going? He says, I'm going, I'm going into a mine. They say, is there something wrong with you? It's barely, the lighting is poor. You're gonna dirty yourself through the mining process. Your hands have become calloused and you deny yourself all the amenities of life, the pleasures of life. But this man understands that every day he can, he's gonna mine 100, 100 carat D flawless diamonds. That's the, gonna be the value of the rough that he's gonna take out of that mine. Every day, 100 carat D flawless diamonds of rough. And he's gonna do this for the next five years. He'll be able to support the next 25 generations. As many children or grandchildren he has. And he knows this. As much as his friends badger him, and try to convince him, and they ridicule him, and tell him he's a fool, but he knows the truth. There's no way that they're in any way going to discourage him. Hashem Odeda Nove means, you know, we don't see things absolutely clear. To internalize it to be a reality, we don't. You need special divine assistance to see it as a reality. What about if you pound the day in, day out? Every day, you're ridiculed, you're denigrated, you're disgraced. So initially, the person is humble, he's truly humble. He says, look, it's not my world, it's God's world. But as they say in English, how, how, how much could you take? After a while, you can't take it any longer. You know, you say to God, just take me. I can't handle it. Hashem says, no, there's so much more to do. I'll give you whatever you need. To understand, you'll have a level of clarity that it's like water off a duck's back. It means nothing. It will not in any way affect your vigor, your enthusiasm, and your understanding of value. That's Hashem Odeh Dan Novim. The Chavetz Chaim writes, we study this, person wants to stop working on, be careful of about a speech. So what's the first thing, the first whisperings, which even inclination comes to a person, realize, how long do you think it's going to last? A day, two days, a week, guaranteed in a month, you're back to where you started, it may be worse. And sure enough, exactly, exactly as the even inclination said to us. So what do you do after a month? Do you try again? So Chavitz Chaim asks, gives, gives, explains it with an allegory. Person's walking on the beach and he finds a few diamonds. The next day he goes on the beach. He says, maybe I'll find more diamonds. So the person says to him, he says, you're, you're a fool. What are you wasting your time? Do you think you'll find diamonds again? It doesn't make a difference. But the first day I did find the diamond because I was looking. So even if I don't find any more diamonds, but whatever I accomplished, it has phenomenal value. Even if it lasts one day that you don't say words that you shouldn't say, what is the value of that? You found diamonds. And he says, not only that, what he tells you is wrong. Because factually, you will succeed. There's failing, there's setbacks, but ultimately you're going to succeed. If you push forward, you're going to succeed. And knowing that in advance, that Hashem will not let us down and abandon us, as much as we believe he did, he did not. That will give us the merit that he's there for us continuously to push, up, push us up that hill.
I remember, you know, when my children were younger, my father, Lava Shalom, we would go to Arsameach to pray on Shabbos or Yom Tif. There were some steep hills he had to walk up. It wasn't easy for him to walk up. So my children, they were only they would have to hold the, his, the bottom of his back, and then made it was easy for him to walk up the steep hill. They just held the bottom of his back. Then he was able to walk. And, but if he wasn't able to walk, he could hold the bottom of his back. He's not moving. He's not moving up that hill. He just needed that slight assistance to get up the hill. We need plenty of assistance. Ultimately, we make the choice. But we only have the inner strength to make the choice. We're making the choice. And Hashem gives us the ability to make the choice because he's there holding our, our back. He's watching our back and allowing us to send that hill and not to fall down the hill and get to the top. That's what, that's what life's all about. So let's talk about a person that didn't say Kriya Shema. Slept late. You know, the rabbi slept late. Guy made a lot of money on that book. The rabbi slept late. Okay. And he didn't say Kriya Shema. He woke up. He didn't put on tefillin. Kriya Shema is a positive commandment. Tefillin is a positive commandment. He didn't put on his talus. Another positive commandment. He missed the Seder. He did matzah. Another positive commandment. He could have built a sukkah. He chose for whatever he's not to build a sukkah. Violate another positive commandment, even deliberately. Didn't buy the four species because he felt it was too expensive. I remember when I was a kid in Canal Street for $3, dollars you get a, a set of Esrogan. Esrogan with a lulav. Today, $150. It's out of my range. But to go to the restaurant and put down $500 and buy a $100 bottle of wine, that's not out of your, out of your price range. But the, the palm branch with the citron and the myrtle and the willow, that's out of my range. And all, it's, its value is only seven days. And what about when you eat the food? How long is its value? When it passes your gullet, it has no value any longer. But nevertheless, it's not with that. It's not outside of your price range. So you don't buy the lulav, positive command. You don't sit in the sukkah because what are the neighbors going to say? What are the neighbors going to say? And you don't say the shema because you want to, you want to sleep late. Tefillin, got to be in the office early. You have every excuse in the world. But God says you have to do every one of them. You know? The Internal Revenue Service says you got to pay your taxes. You say, I'm not paying my taxes. What do they do? They'll put a lien on your, uh, they'll garnish your wages. They'll put a lien on your house. They'll evict you if they have to sell the house to pay your taxes, plus penalty. You got to do what you got to do. God says you have to do it. Of course, I give you choice. You have to say the Shema. You have to acknowledge who I am. I'm paying the bills. I'm underwriting this. This enterprise. You're my children. I want you to identify as my children. Therefore, you would fill on your hand and on your head, which has those parchments in it that tell volumes of who you are, who I am. And wearing that will give you that sense of that. That identifies who you are. And many things, everything, the, all these positive commandments. Now, the person finally, he gets a little humble. You know, he made an investment. He thought he was God's gift to Wall Street. And he took a nosedive. And right now, he can't even pay his mortgage. All of a sudden, his cage is rattled. And he starts, says, you know something? I better go speak to the rabbi. Rabbi says, you know something? Come off your high horse. But you have to come off your high horse yourself, not to be knocked off your high horse. God already knocked you off your high horse. They don't write you up in Wall Street Journal that you're the rainmaker any longer. They used to, but not any longer. Now they have you on the obituary page, in the back of the paper. That's where it is. Now the person's doing tshuva. How, what does he need 
to bring him back to full reinstatement. So the Rambam, based on the Talmud, says that tshuva in its own right, a person is sincerely remorseful and makes a commitment. He will never miss Tillin. He will never miss the Shema. He will always say in its proper time. He will eat that matzah at the Seder. He will sit in that sukkah. He will take those four species and only God knows the sincerity of his mind and his heart. But if he makes the, the grade, he's fully forgiven. And the words of the Talmud and the Rambam, he does not move from there till he's fully forgiven. Full reinstatement needs nothing. Doesn't have to suffer any longer. Doesn't have to experience a Yom Kippur. Just remorse, commitment, and being sincere. God says, it like it never happened. You never violated any of these positive commandments. But of course, even if you do that, you'll be reinstated. But on your balance sheet, there's no credit for Tefillin. There's no credit for Shema. There's no credit for Matzah. There's no credit for Sukkah. There's no credit for the four species. Of course, factually, he didn't put them on. You didn't put the Tefillin on. You didn't wear the Tzitzis. You didn't do any of these things. But in terms of the reversal is still connected, fully connected. Okay, now we start. Now, now the account starts. You want to make it, you want to deposit in the account? Fine. So now we're open to be, begin enter, entries into this account. Hopefully, there'll all be positive entries, no negative entries. What about a person violates a negative commandment? I like. McDonald burgers. I like, you know, chop suey, lahavdil, chas v'sholem. All this kind of stuff. Sea, seafood, shellfish. He likes it. Now he wants to do chuva on that. Well, he only eats kosher species, but it's kosher style. You know, he goes to, uh, what's the name? A restaurant, Lori said, somebody, some Romanian. You get, well, we get goulash, but it wasn't kosher. On Lower East Side, Christie Street, there, Pike over there. That's where they used to go. Or Second Avenue Deli, where Clinton used to go with his wife, you know, whatever it was called. It was, wasn't kosher. That's a negative commandment. And you have true remorse, and you commit yourself, you would only eat kosher. You'll even become vegetarian. That's the precaution you're taking since you don't eat kosher. You're not fully forgiven. You have to experience a Yom Kippur, which innately is holy. The innateness of its holiness allows you to be fully reinstated. The truth itself will not do it. I'll give you an example. Person is soiled. And to be able to remove the this, this soil which is embedded in his, in his skin, in the crevices of his body, he has to really soak in a certain type of solution which will release the soil from, from the, which is embedded, and only then is he fully clean, is he cleansed. It's identical. When you violate a negative commandment, you could have remorse, you can make a commitment, you have to be experienced that spiritual ritual pool. That's Yom Kippur. The holiness of the day and God's overwhelming attribute of mercy. Only a combination of your tshuva and that are you fully cleansed? Are you fully reinstated? Because a negative commandment has greater level of severity when you transgress it in a positive commandment. Okay, so if you get negative commandment, repentance, and Yom Kippur allows you to be fully reinstated. So what about a person violated a negative commandment or a positive command which carries liability of spiritual excision, which is much more serious? Now, what do you need to bring that a full reinstatement? That you need repentance. Sincere remorse, sincere commitment never to go back there. And only God knows 
Yom Kippur, still not enough. You have to have some kind of level of pain, whether it's emotional, physical, financial, whatever it is. Only in conjunction, everything together, only then are you fully atoned. The Chavos of Avos writes, duties of the heart, the greatest, the best suffering is disgrace. To be disgraced. Not to be given the honor you think you deserve. Why? If a person physically has a setback, he's physically impaired. If he's financially hurt, he doesn't have what he had before. But if you're disgraced, what is it? You're pained, but it's all ego. There's no innate, there's no damage. Therefore, you could recover easy, easier from that. Because if you, now, if you become humble, it's okay. It's only because your ego has been actually, has been hurt. Did you hear the way they spoke to me? I thought all of a sudden now that I don't have the money, they don't even look at me when I walk into the synagogue. They took my nameplate off, off my seat. Could you imagine? The doorman doesn't say hello to me any longer. He treats me like I'm a delivery boy. Okay. But that's the best kind of suffering to, to experience. Because there's no, there's no downside to it. There's no physical damage. Not financial, not physical, anything. That's the best, that's the best he's sure to have. What about a person desecrates God's name? That's much more difficult. You desecrate God's name, could you imagine? There, the only way you can be fully reinstated, fully, person has to die. The process of the soul departing from the body has a degree of pain. Nobody wants to die. Even a person is comatose, the soul doesn't want to leave the body. It has to be literally yanked out of the body. That removal, that extrication, has a degree of pain, whatever that pain is, that completes the atonement process because of the severity of what, of what we call chil Hashem, disgracing God's name. These are various things. A person, God forbid, lost an arm in an, in an accident because he wasn't careful enough, inadvertent. As much as the man has remorse and commits himself, he will always be responsible you realize that limb is not coming back. Not coming back. A person can do something so severe, sin-wise, transgression-wise, you've been so disenfranchised from God, it's like the relationship doesn't exist any longer. But yet, Hashem says, the process of tshuva, if you're truly sincere, in the regret and in the recommitment, it's like it never happened. You've restored. Could you imagine after they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where it was a level of destruction not to be imagined, and somebody says, if you say these five words with a certain intent, it's gonna be restored within a, mo a moment, or instantaneously. They say, you know something, you better go get yourself medicated. I mean, how's it possible? But factually, tshuva is a miracle process. Hashem says, and was, the Ramam writes, that if a person was evil all his life, his, his whole life, entirety, at the worst level, the last moment he, of his life, he does tshuva, when he goes, before the heavenly tribunal, there will not be anything negative on his record. Because before he died, he had sincere remorse. And if he could have lived more years, he would have never repeated it. And only God knows the sincerity of the person. And if it was there, the record is wiped clean. It's not on the record any longer. What does that mean? How's it possible? Full restoration. Where he's going to be in the world to come, that's a different story.
Factually, his whole life, he never did it. He never did any mitzvahs, right? Now he believes in God. He has remorse that he missed every opportunity. And he's paying to his core before he dies. But still, there's no claim on his record against him. He will not be prosecuted for anything. You know what that is? You know what kind of chesed that is? You could make a difference in one moment for a whole lifetime. To go and be in the Garden of Eden, that relation with God, despite the fact that when your lifetime, as the Ramam says, before a person does tshuva, he's despised. He's detested. He's an abomination. The moment the person does tshuva, he's ohuv, he's beloved. He's desirable and he's precious. That's the difference from one moment to the next. What, what makes the difference? What's in your mind and what's in your heart? We just had Moshe Rabbeinu says, it's not in heaven, it's not on the other side of the sea. It's in your mouth and your heart to do. And many of the commentators explained this going on in the midst of doing tshuva. It's all in your mind and your heart and your, and your, and your verbalization. And if you really are able to understand the reality of that, you haven't made. You haven't made. Could you imagine? Person thinks, because he's a smart person, he becomes a wise guy. And he meets the person who makes things happen. And he believes in his own image, his own ability, which is nothing compared to this person he's speaking to. And he doesn't accord that person proper respect to any degree. He be behaves disgracefully because he's so caught up in his own mindset, which is nothing. W what's that person? Now he realizes, he gets a little smarter, he realizes what he did. The man can't live with himself. Even if the man who was disgraced forgives him, the person still is pained. How could he behave so disrespectfully? That, 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 that's the indication of a quality person. To come to realization, even if the man forgives you, I feel ashamed forever. How could I behave that way? I'll tell you, it happens, you know? You know, unfortunately, parents don't live forever. And the times now in lives where we did certain things to our parents, which may have been disrespectful or not respectful enough. And if we could live our lives over, now that we're older and more mature and understand, we would never have done that ever again. Until today, it could have been 50 years, 60 years have passed. You're pained when you think about a word you had said, which wasn't appropriate. And you said it due to your immaturity. Your parents forgive you. They forgive you. There's no question. They forgave you because they loved you. But it has nothing to do with you being ashamed and being pained that you didn't offer them that proper respect, especially what they did for you. So God forgives you. But even if he forgives you, if you're really that quality person, you'll always feel ashamed and un it's unconscious what you did and you have difficult living with it. And you can never forget about it for the same reason. You know, many years ago, there was a certain person who was affiliated with us. And the Gemara tells us that Talmud that a Torah sage who waves his honor, his honor is waved. He has a right to, to wave his own honor. Why? Because based on a verse in, in Tilim, that before a person studies Torah, it's called Torah Hashem. It's called God's Torah. After you study it, it's called Torah. So it's the one who studies, it's his Torah. So because it's considered his, the Torah sage who waves his honor, it's waved. So this person, he did not treat Tamidich with appropriate respect. 
proper respect. But you should have known better. So I said to him, with me, he treated me with respect because I, I, I would give him over his head. There's no way I put up with his nonsense, this person. But other people who you want to say they were humble, meek, because that was their demeanor, they didn't say anything. So I said to him, I said, how do you behave this way? He says, it's okay because they, they forgive me in either case. You, you ever hear such, such a justification? Since they forgive me in either case, therefore I've raked, I, have, I, I don't have a problem crossing those lines. I say, you mean, you have a right to steal if there's gonna be uh, amnesty for, for, for thieves. He's still your thief. What does amnesty have to be with you doing a thief? You're doing the wrong thing. How do you behave this way? Because he's nice enough to forgive you. How do you behave this way? Well, because I know he's going to forgive me in either case. So therefore, I can sleep at night. But what does it say about you? You don't appreciate who he is. It doesn't, it doesn't let you off the hook. Even though he may forgive you, but in God's, God's eyes, who are you? You are a person that doesn't have any respect for Torah whatsoever. Of course, you have this angle that he's going to forgive you, but what, to what degree do you respect or esteem Torah? The answer is zero. You know something? There's a claim against you regardless whether he forgives you or doesn't forgive you. And until the person comes to that realization, he has no problem living with himself. But once he realizes it, he's ashamed. If he realizes as he should, he's ashamed of his behavior because the behavior is unacceptable. Okay, we're going to stop here this week. Maybe we're going to have another, every week, every day at 12 o'clock, we're going to do something similar to this to build towards you. Recording in progress. Thank you, Rabbi.